Hey, I'm Robin, and this is BitBirdie. Today, we're going to learn about semaphores in Godot Engine, and I'm going to go over a couple of examples that are hopefully more clear than the example in the docs. The first one is going to be a really simple example just to show you what semaphores do and how to use them. And the second one is going to be a more fleshed out example of how semaphores can be used to solve a classic programming problem. I'm going to assume you already know about threads and mutexes going into this video, but if you don't, I'll have a video about threads by Godot Tutorials and a video about mutexes by yours truly linked in the description below. Okay, let's get into it. Okay, so we're in the main scene, which contains the script for the simple example. And by the way, I'll have this repo available on my GitHub, so I'll put that link in the description below as well. So here we're just creating three threads and then we're getting them to execute do thing. And then they'll encounter this semaphore here. So what is a semaphore? A semaphore is just an object that contains a counter, like just an integer. When the counter is zero and we call semaphore.wait, it will block threads from executing past this line. So the threads will just be waiting here. This is just like how mutex.lock makes threads wait. But the difference with a semaphore is that whenever the counter is something other than zero, it will let threads through. So when the counter is, let's say one, one thread will be able to go past the semaphore.wait and continue executing. And when that thread passes through, the counter will decrement back to zero and it will continue blocking the remaining threads. If the counter was two, it would be able to let two threads through and then block the remaining threads. So how do we change this counter? That's what semaphore.post is for. And semaphores only have wait and post. These are the only things you can do with it in Godot engine. When you call semaphore.post, it will increment the counter and let one thread through. So we can see this in action if we just play the main scene. You can minimize that. So here you see these three waitings. That's because the three threads were created and then they started executing do thing. And they're just waiting here. They did not go past this semaphore because the counter is initialized at zero. Let's just scroll down. When I press UI accept or the space bar, semaphore.post will be called and it will let one thread through. All right, so now I'll press the space bar. So one thread got through and printed the thing. So we can do that with the rest of the threads as well. And then now pressing the spacebar won't do anything because there are no threads waiting anymore. Down here in exit tree, we have to make sure that we call semaphore.post for each of our threads, just in case they're still waiting. If we don't do that, you can see what happens. So our threads are waiting at, the, at this line here. And if we want to close this, it actually just hangs and it's just frozen now because it's waiting for the threads to finish execution, but they never will because the semaphore is blocking them. So we can't close it here, but we can actually stop the process by clicking that. So essentially what semaphores do is make threads wait and make them go kind of on demand. But this was a pretty trivial example. How would we use semaphores in a slightly more realistic scenario? Well, the classic use case of semaphores is to solve a classic computing problem called the producer consumer problem. So in the producer consumer problem, you have a producer, you have a consumer and you have a buffer, which is basically just a block of finite memory. A more familiar representation of a buffer would be an array. Okay. Here's our array. It has seven blocks that you could fill with stuff. So that's what the producer is going to do. It's going to produce and fill the buffer with stuff. So it's going to produce one, it'll produce, it'll keep producing. And what the consumer does is it consumes whatever the producer has produced. So it's gonna, it's gonna empty this array. So the producer and consumer are threads which have access to this shared memory. So there's no guarantee that the producer will produce and the consumer will consume in sync. They're just gonna access this memory whenever they can. So there's a situation where the producer will fill up this buffer. In this case, we don't want the producer to keep trying to fill it up. We want it to wait for there to be empty spots like this. Also, when the array is empty, we don't want the consumer to come in and try consuming. We want it to wait for the producer to put something in here for the consumer to consume. So that's the problem. How do we make the producer only produce when there's space in the buffer? And how do we make the consumer only consume when there's something in the buffer? We can actually use two semaphores to solve this problem. It might be helpful to follow along in the repo for this one because it's quite a bit more complex than the previous example and make sure you're in the producer consumer scene. I've temporarily removed any of the semaphore related code so that we could see what happens without the semaphores. Okay, so we're gonna have 
two producer threads and two consumer threads, and our buffer is gonna have a max size of 10. We're gonna start off by creating all the threads and having the producer threads run produce and the consumer threads run consume. Both of these functions contain an infinite while loop where a thread will lock a mutex, blocking all the other threads, and then do something with the shared buffer. For producers, if there's room in the buffer, it's gonna generate a random number and just add it to the buffer. And then it'll just print the buffer. If there isn't any room in the buffer, it's just gonna print can produce. And then it'll unlock the mutex, giving other threads the opportunity to access the buffer. And then for consumers, it's gonna check if the buffer contains anything. And if it does, it's just gonna remove an element from the buffer and then print it. And if the buffer is empty, they're just gonna print can't consume. So I should explain this line as well. When we're exiting the scene, I'm setting this to true and it lets the threads break out of this loop and it'll let us exit the app. All right, so let's just run this. All right, let's see what happened at the beginning. So it looks like a producer was the first one to grab this mutex and lock it, blocking all the other threads from accessing this code. And by the way, th this mutex is the same as the one down here. So it's also blocking consumers. So when the first producer came and started executing this, there were, the other producer was waiting up here and the two consumers were also waiting here. So a producer grabbed the array and then it generated a random number and then pushed it to the array. And then that happened again and again and again. It's kind of interesting that it takes so long for a consumer to access the buffer. We actually can't see when they do it because Godot doesn't print all the output. So we need to go into the console and we'll be able to see it eventually. So let's see, go all the way to the top and oh yeah. So finally, when the buffer was full and you couldn't produce, a consumer came in and uh, was able to access the buffer and the consumers started consuming. And then the buffer got empty and the consumers could no longer consume. So this would kind of just repeat again and again. Eventually the producers will, uh, oh, this is actually the next run. So I guess it didn't uh, wipe the history, but basically you get the idea. So we don't want all these wasted cycles. We don't want the producer to access the buffer and then just say it can't produce or vice versa with the consumer. What we wanna do is have the producers wait until there's actually space in the buffer for them to add something to it. And we want the consumers to wait until the buffer is not empty so that it can consume something. And we can use two semaphores to do this. So one semaphore to tell the producer when they can produce and one semaphore to tell the consumer when to consume. Okay, so I've added back all the semaphore code now and I've added a little comment to indicate that it's a new line of code that I've added. So now we have our new semaphores, sem empty and sem full. We're gonna use sem empty to make the producers wait when the buffer is full and go when the buffer has room. And we're gonna use sem full to make the consumers wait when the buffer is empty and go when the buffer has something to consume. Let's scroll down to the actual stuff. And I'll explain these two lines in just a second. Let's start with produce. So when we start the app, the producers are gonna come into this while loop and then they're gonna wait at this line. We don't actually want them to wait. The shared buffer is initialized as empty, which means that there is max array size or 10 spaces for a producer to add to the array. So that's why we're gonna call post on this semaphore 10 times. That's gonna increment the counter to 10 and it's gonna let 10 threads through. Well, we only have two threads, but since we're in this infinite loop, they're just gonna pass through the semaphore again and again. And every time the semaphore lets a thread through, it's gonna decrement the counter. So producer will come through, decrement the counter, now it's nine, and then it's gonna add something to the array. And now the array has one element in it and only nine free spaces. And then after the producer has added to the array, it's gonna call post on sem full. So what this is gonna do is increment sem full, which is gonna let one consumer through. So this makes a lot of sense. The producer has added one element to the array, which means there's at least one element for the consumer to consume. So one consumer can go through and has a chance to lock this mutex and access this shared buffer and remove that element. And then it's gonna call post on sem empty, which will increment sem empty up here, letting it know that there's one more empty space in this buffer that's available for the producer to add to. And then in exit tree, we're going to call post on each of the semaphores enough times to make sure that there are for sure no threads waiting for the semaphores. Okay, so let's run this and see what it looks like. Okay, so 
you can see that there is no more of the can't consume, can't produce shenanigans. And things are consuming, things are producing, and it all looks pretty good. So we don't even need this if statement in either of these because the semaphores are making sure that consumers and producers are accessing the buffer at the right time. I really hope that made sense. I'll try to answer any questions you guys have in the comments, but I should let you know that I'm not really an expert in multi-threading or semaphores or mutexes, but I'll do my best. Anyway, I hope you all have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.